The Silk Road is a monument to the evolution of global diplomacy. It's a path that led to the transmutation of our very existence. Today, we're going to talk about how this legendary trade route came to be, how it connected us, how it influenced culture, and how it was as dangerous as it was profitable. Also, we'll discuss how it made its regional founders one of the most powerful nations in the modern world. As tends to be the case with all things, the Silk Road was not a deliberate invention, meaning that it was the confluence of continental activity rather than a singular idea. For thousands of years, traders and envoys carved out various pathways to barter with neighboring towns and tribes. Many historians trace the origins of the Silk Road to the most ancient of eastern trade routes. The network is considered by many as another product of the steppe. The steppe, a grassland belt about 5,000 miles long, from Hungary through Ukraine and Central Asia to Manchuria, was and is a very unforgiving place. The Eurasian steppe reaches around a fifth of the planet. For most of its existence, it was dominated by blood feuds between hostiles and was generally considered unconquerable terrain. That was, until the native people discovered ways to make it their home. As far back as 3500 BCE, horses were being domesticated in what is now Kazakhstan. This cavalry development was the first accelerating agent for commerce around the steppe. We know this because inventions like the recurve bow, traded by Scythians and others, have been dug up by 21st century archaeologists. With the assistance of this powerful animal, primitive merchant classes formed, profiting off the much-needed information and weaponry in circulation. Eventually, there were enough participants to plant the seed that would eventually become the greatest profit engine the world had ever known. Another important disclaimer about the Silk Road is that it wasn't formally identified as such until 1877. People who used it had never really considered giving a complex overchanging web like this a single title. The Silk Road we refer to today was coined by Ferdinand von Richthofen, a German geographer and historian. He chose this name because, as one can venture to guess, silk dominated the market at virtually every juncture. This is why many mainstream analysts prefer to mark the formal opening of the road as 130 to 140 BCE, even if silk was a hot commodity being traded as far as ancient Egypt. To fully understand this, we need to review what was brewing in what the ancient Greeks called Ceres, the land of silk. In 221 BCE, the Qin Dynasty dominated the mainland and reigned supreme. Before the presence of the emperor Qin Shi Huang, the land was made up of small kingdoms and the China we know today didn't even exist. During the next 15 years, this new imperial presence managed to achieve the impossible. But this way of governing came at a price. The death toll during this short time was unfathomable, even by today's standards. According to some historians, some signs show that half the reign's population, a number reaching as high as 28 million, fell dead beneath its shadow. Centuries later, archaeologists would look upon the sites surrounding China's first emperor. Even though his presence had resulted in unprecedented carnage, the respect the people had for him was undeniable. As one can see now what stands around him, the terracotta warriors, 8,000 meticulously crafted life-size soldiers, most of which are still buried, the eighth wonder of the world. According to ancient texts, a map of the known world sits in Qin's burial chamber, undoubtedly a drop in the bucket compared to what his successors would discover in the near future. After the death of the first emperor, resentment from the peasant classes reached a boiling point, plunging ancient China into a brutal civil war. After the bloodshed, the Han Dynasty emerged, founded by Liu Bang. The Han kept some of the policies of the Qin that stabilized China, such as the new centralized government and administrative structures that made the fledgling nation more organized and bureaucratic. However, the Han Dynasty promoted Taoism, a philosophy that let the nobles and cities operate somewhat independently. Although this was necessary at the start, it had dire consequences for much of China. The somewhat libertarian approach left the countryside vulnerable. During the reign of Emperor Jing, over 10,000 people found themselves kidnapped and enslaved by hostile powers. By 141 BCE, the Han, as much of the world would soon call them, 
were under the rule of their seventh emperor, Wu Di, or simply Wu. To many experts on East Asia, Emperor Wu Di was exceptionally cunning. He knew that the Taoist regimes of yesteryear were divisive, so he adopted Confucianism as the state's national philosophy. This transition to filial piety, moderation, and virtue compelled the nobility to start defending its borders and avoid domestic tyranny. Although it took a lot of time for this to take hold, given the fact that many members of the court denounced Wu, it was obvious the tide was changing. The new order was in control, and many members of the citizenry were eager to show their worth. One of these figures was an emissary named Zhang Qian. He would go on to be considered the secondary founder of the Silk Road. Zhang is one of the most complex figures in history. Depending on what source you delve into, he can be depicted as a simple courtier or a heroic missionary. Just three years before the aforementioned discourse in 138 BCE, Wu had sent Zhang Qiang to the west to negotiate with the Yuezi people. Jiang Nu were a people that constantly threatened the stability of the Han Dynasty, finally pushing Wu to seek support from Central Asia and other Western powers. Zhang's first mission into the unknown region was an abysmal failure. Not only did he fail to gain support from their neighbors, but the Zhang Nu actually captured him. Many setbacks prevented him from returning to China for 13 years. According to legend, only one of his hundred assistants returned with him to tell the tale. The only real victory? Making first contact and discovering the potential commerce to be had throughout East Asia. During Zhang's absence, Emperor Wu turned his sights inward at the court. After all, his diplomat had disappeared and the fair assumption was that he died. He faced significant obstacles such as the Tiger Tally, which acted as a sort of key to control the military. Until this primary opponent, the Grand Empress Dowager Dao, passed away, he was playing a very complex familial chess game. In 135 BCE, Wu was finally unopposed and continued with his reform ambitions. He forced the nobility to go back to their fiefdoms, no longer able to dip into the government coffers. Checkpoints had to be sanctioned by the increasingly centralized government. The nobles were now rewarded when they called out corruption returning property to the state if need be. Finally, and perhaps most importantly, Wu started recruiting and promoting talented commoners to high positions of government. Not only did this remove power from the noble classes, but it allowed Wu to hire based on merit, while slowly giving more governmental authority to the emperor. Once he found his way back, just as Columbus would later do for the Spanish, Zhang presented a world of riches to the imperial court. This mysterious diplomat talked about the ancient societies that dominated deserts and kingdoms that believed they had descended from gods. One of the notable discoveries made by Zhang was the heavenly horses found in Fergana. Once again, horses became a crown jewel of eastern survival. After the people of the region refused to sell them, Wu sent 60,000 men over 1,491.30 miles to capture them by force, further securing the strength of the Han finally putting an end to the Zhangnu threat. These large new horses allowed caravans to traverse harsh terrain, giving traders access to jade from the Tarim Basin. The genie was out of the bottle. For decades, the state of China was only traveling to consolidate power and preserve a fragile legacy. However, seven years after Zhang's miraculous return home, the age of exploration had finally begun. Zhang was sending experienced observers to every pocket of the continent. Envoys were exchanged and information was being received from lands as far as Alexander the Great's Hellenistic outposts. Emperor Wu's brilliance in court made sure that none of these new proposals would be challenged. The golden age of the Han Dynasty had officially begun. Emperor Wu and his descendants did nothing but encourage the growth of the Silk Road. As stated previously, many historians would prefer to use the term Silk Routes as there were many different paths. Regardless, the court was becoming obscenely rich, but there were a few things standing in the way of making them even richer. Two of these things were the Gobi and Taklamalan deserts. For a long time, these regions were actually an asset to the Chinese, forming a defensive barrier to protect them from a northern assault. However, it was also one of the only passages at the beginning of the Silk Road trade. 
the Taklaman is 85% sand dunes, and many traders wouldn't survive the first sandstorm, vanishing under the sand they tried to traverse. Also, there were bandits on both sides, which actually incentivized Great Wall expansion. Moving further west, there was valuable trade on the Tibetan Plateau. That said, in contrast to how we view Tibet today, it was not a capital of peace just yet. It was mainly comprised of small warring states and nomadic tribes, who were a constant threat to many cities in China. South of the 230,000 square mile Himalayas was another trade partner, India. For India, the Silk Road brought arguably as much wealth as it did China. According to historians, the Silk Road took the form of three probable routes, Srinagar, Gilgit, and Karakaram Range. The Purushapar and Hada, Kapisa, Bamiyan, and Balkh. India's spices were a real prize for foreign traders, so the Silk Road was nothing less than transformative. Kazakhstan, Russia, Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, Turkmenistan, and Uzbekistan were in some ways the products of the Silk Road. Many picture a single trader crossing Eurasia to hand textiles to a world leader, but this was never the case, if not extremely rare. In truth, small checkpoints and settlements rose up to help mitigate the burden of a long voyage. Like most products today, the item passes through hundreds if not thousands of hands before making it to the final destination. Because of this, it became profitable to build a settlement along a silk route, as business would essentially fall on your lap. In the heart of the Silk Road, great powers in the Middle East benefited greatly from the rising trade. Pakistan, Afghanistan, Persia, Iraq, and Syria often acted alongside the former as sophisticated middlemen, controlling the long-distance trade between the East and West. In 500 BCE, Darius I built the thousand-mile Persian Royal Road from the Tigris River serving as the precursor to the Silk Road expansion 300 years later. Tea, dyes, perfumes, and porcelain were among the many things exchanged at the height of the Silk Road. Speaking of sophisticated middlemen, Turkey played as big a role as any other, constructing countless roadside inns, known as caravanserais, to lighten the burden of trade across continents. Not only that, but many Turkish traders participated in extremely long voyages to the point where variations of the Turkish language can be heard along the 3,694.67 mile trek to western China. Another influential player, once through the Caucasus, was Greece. Like Turkey, the Greek language was often employed for the exchange of valuable information. Much of the Greek trade took place between the fabled nation-state and Egypt. Carthage, Ethiopia, and the Arabian Peninsula. A separate effort from Darius's Royal Road, endorsed by Alexander the Great in 329 BCE, connected settlements like Alexandria and Samarkand, encouraging the possibility of trade with the East. Lastly, and perhaps most importantly, the Silk Road connected the empires of the East to arguably the strongest Western power in history, the Roman Empire. Put simply, Rome was the final great link of the chain connecting the two sides of the developed world. Rome's participation in this great enterprise was the first step to globalization. With this strengthening relationship spanning over 4,700 miles, humanity would never be the same. Isolated growth was now a thing of the past, and people from all over the world began making a concerted effort not just to profit from one another in the marketplace, but to share ideas as well. The Silk Road faced periods where travel was restricted, but during times of mass cooperation, great thinkers, inventors, artists, and craftsmen would venture great distances to share and collaborate with their newfound neighbors. When Rome inherited the roads created by the Arabs and Greeks, the first great trade wave had officially begun. Roman artifacts such as glassware had been discovered as far as the Korean peninsula. Strabo, a Greek philosopher, geographer, and historian, one of the witnesses to the fall of the Republic, stated that up to 120 ships were setting sail every year from Myos Hormos in Roman Egypt to Indian ports. There was even a travel guide in circulation after 60 AD CE, Periplus of the Erythraean Sea which outlined the best trade opportunities along the Red Sea. Perhaps the most prevalent product to be traded along the Silk Road was religion. One of the first to spread was Zoroastrianism, 
a centralizing practice made into Iran's state faith in the 3rd century CE. Judaism mingled nicely with other spiritual communities as well, founding settlements in places like Samarkand and Bukhara. At this time, there were hundreds of sects interacting with Judaism and many converted without the need for proselytizing. Christianity and Manichaeism were common to see along central routes as well, although only the former survived assimilation events, while the latter faded into obscurity. By the 7th century CE, Islam became the majority faith along the Silk Road, at least in the center of the primary routes. The simple reason for this is that Islam had mercantile routes, making it tailor-made for growing checkpoints on the ever-expanding trade network. The religion that left the greatest impact on China and the East, and perhaps the strongest footprint, was Buddhism. Between the 1st and 3rd century CE, the rise of the Kushan Empire fueled exponential growth for the once minor faith. Five out of the 18 schools of interpretation operated on the Silk Road. Its presence made such an indelible mark that later faiths occupied and maintained the spiritual outposts these practitioners had built. Chinese acceptance ensured the long-term survival of Buddhist teachings, spreading the word to both Korea and Japan. Devoted travelers like Zhuang Zhang, a pilgrim monk, transported a collection of 650 manuscripts on Buddhism. Due to the great influence of the Silk Road, Buddhism is the fourth largest religion, with a following of 520 million, between 7 to 8 percent of the global population. This kind of cross-cultural expansion also had a great effect on material goods and their proliferation. When the rest of the world was introduced to such fine craftsmanship from other nations, it prompted them to share their own. For the next 1,300 years, the Silk Road served as a melting pot for creatives to hone their skills as well as build on pre-existing work with knowledge from their background. One of the innovations to come out of this widespread collaboration was the Noria, a hydro-powered scoop wheel used to lift water into a small aqueduct. It carries water to farmland in nearby cities. Transportation of new food, such as oranges or grapes, changes the way countries approach culinary traditions. The benefits were grand and far beyond what anybody could have ever predicted, but material gains often come with violent conditions. Throughout the Silk Road's existence, it should come as no surprise that it's been a tool to aid in battle as much as it's been a tool for profit and education. As connected as the West and East had become through trade, the human condition was still at large. Being so far away from one another, the two great empires, the Romans and the Han, still believed that their own society was the center of the universe. Historically, China always treasured one thing above all others, horses. As stated previously, the dynasty went to great lengths to capture territory in the steppe that was hospitable for the finest breeds and traded their prized silk, jade, and ceramics for this once coveted mode of transportation. With it, along with military equipment and supplies, they initiated an expansion project that would cover over 1 million square miles with a population of almost 50 million people. At the time of Augustus, China now had an inner strength that dwarfed what was seen in Italy. Unfortunately, as often happens, with rapid expansion and dominance, the values that preserved this power began to fade. Ambition eclipsed pragmatism, and the Han started a lengthy war against the Tibetan people, specifically the Xiang. Although the conflict resulted in a slight victory, the wealth acquired from a decade of Silk Road trade had been spent frivolously. As a result, the long-oppressed northern tribes began to rebel. Emperor Wu's Confucian approach had corroded to the point where the generals, landlords, and politicians acted independently to serve their own special interests. The long peace that preceded this series of battles left high social classes careless and unprepared. The damage was irreparable. The Yellow Turban Rebellion, led by Zhang Zhu, was comprised of 360,000 warrior peasants. Although the Han managed to quell the uprising, it was hopelessly incapable of regaining control of its territory. Warlords emerged, and the Age of the Three Kingdoms had begun. Bridging the gap between China and Rome, reigning over much of the Middle East, was Parthia. It was a cultural haven for much of its existence. The region became an intellectual oasis, where people of all races and creeds would convene to share the latest developments from their respective countries. It too profited greatly from the spoils of the Silk Road, 
but it functioned more like a coalition of independent kingdoms, each with its own armies that could be summoned for a price. Like the Han with wealth garnered by the trade routes, paradoxically made them too powerful for their own good. Although they were able to stave off the onslaught of Roman attacks under the fierce leadership of Crassus, Augustus, Mark Anthony, and others, their less centralized governance, in conjunction with the peasant rebellions, saw that their stance on the world stage was less than stable. The heart of Parthia was crushed in 226 CE, when Artaseer I, a great leader of the more centralized Sassanids, entered Tessaphon. For two more centuries, Rome would hold on to its politically shaky position. For hundreds of years, it benefited greatly from the Silk Road trade. Its aristocracy widely adorned themselves with silk, using it as a symbol of status and untouchable prestige. However, Rome's neighbors on all sides profited greatly from the same trade. Over time, just like the Han, wealth was no longer enough to silence the oppressed. The political rot had reached the very foundations of what was once considered an empire where the sun would never set. Old foes of the Han dynasty, the relentless Huns, took advantage of the crumbling monolith. Along with the Visigoths, Avars, and Slavs, tribes benefiting from one of the same trails that made Rome rich were finally in a position to reclaim what had been lost many years ago. In 410 CE, the Visigoth king Alaric unleashed a Germanic force capable of sacking the city of Rome. Although the Eastern Byzantine Empire would preserve its legacy, the developing world, fueled by the Silk Road trade, had outgrown the established world order. The tumultuous period of seemingly endless sacking and raiding led to a bleak, communicative winter, cutting the once Great Silk Road into a series of much less profitable segments. That is, until the Tang Dynasty surfaced in 618 CE. In the following decades, battle erupted in the lost corridors of the region. One of these great Tang victories involved the defeat of the Eastern Gokturk Khaganate, former allies of the Sui Empire. When the dust had finally settled, the Tang Dynasty regained full control of the Tarim Basin, the Gansu Corridor, a vital 620-mile land passage, as well as the Xinjiang, which had been under control of various Turkic tribes with the help of Sogdians, Iranian people vital to the diplomatic stability, between both hemispheres of the Silk Road, the Tang fought their way into reopening all major veins, making the Silk Road stronger than it had ever been before. Unfortunately, after the Tang fell in 960 CE, the Silk Road was once again closed for two centuries under the rule of the Song Empire, who found themselves woefully incapable of controlling the Gansu Corridor. That is, until the warriors of the steppe raised their banners in 1206 CE. The strength of Genghis Khan and his Mongol horde was something the world had never seen before. The territorial expansion that Rome had achieved in 400 years was matched by the Mongols in just 25. This was truly the peak of horseback warfare, and the Khanate was seemingly centuries ahead of its formidable neighbors. Many rulers in Europe, especially the princes of modern-day Russia, perceived the remarkably swift Mongol conquest as some sort of divine punishment. To the west, between 1207 to 1360 CE, the Islamic Caliphate was silenced, and kingdoms as far as Poland felt the wrath of these mysterious barbarians that behaved more like a hurricane than a traditional army. By the middle of the 13th century, no empire had come close to the size of the Mongols. A staggering 12 million square miles was under their control, and with it, the Silk Road. For the first time ever, the planet's cultural power line was under the control of one leader. Finally, the Silk Road was at its best during the presence of the Yuan Dynasty, catalyzed by the fruitful presence of the Mongol Empire. Travelers like Marco Polo traveled along the Silk Road, taking detailed, albeit sometimes exaggerated, accounts of the cultural wellsprings along the now legendary path. Detailed accounts, like Polo's journey between 1271 to 1294 CE, helped to paint a picture of the countless developments brought into existence from centuries of trade and communication. From that point on, there was nowhere to go but down. The segment in Central Asia was temporarily opened by Tamerlane in 1368 CE. But after his death in 1405 CE, the Silk Road was on its way to being a long-forgotten jewel of the past. At least for the next four centuries. 
One of the earliest accounts hinting at the death of the overland trade from Marco Polo's own memoir, he describes the arrival of merchants trading in the Caspian Sea. For hundreds of years, Europeans had been searching for ways to cut out Middle Eastern middlemen. There were many cases where traders just broke even or ended up losing money by the time they passed through the many checkpoints to East Asia. Portuguese explorers like Bartolomeu Diaz took time to venture out into open waters, finding a viable sailing route around Africa and the Indian Ocean. These 15th and 16th century discoveries paved the way for oceanic trade, which was much faster and cost-effective. That said, overland trade didn't suddenly go extinct. There are many narratives that talk about the end of the Silk Road, almost implying that everyone just packed up and left. In truth, the roads and pathways just changed slightly and evolved over time, making them unrecognizable to those less versed on the development of trade in Eurasia. According to Forbes, Eurasia, the continental landmass that contains both Europe and Asia, is rapidly being drawn into a single massive market covering upwards of 65% of the population, 75% of energy resources, and 40% of GDP in the world, and its revolutionized rail routes that are the strings tying it all together. To date, there are three rail corridors linking China to the rest of Europe, the Trans-Siberian Express in the north the central route across Kazakhstan, and the southern route that leads to Aktau. According to most analysts, the time for transporting goods takes about two weeks. The three powers in control of these routes, which ranged from old to mid-development, are China, the Eurasian Economic Union, and the EU. The established trade routes that make up this network exceed 5,500 miles. The question that inevitably follows the release of this information is, does the Silk Road still exist? The unsatisfactory answer to this question, both yes and no. Although these massive trade networks often cross the same paths as the Silk Routes once did, they barely resemble what preceded it. Throughout the modern age, political climate, warfare, and changing value of various commodities have turned the Silk Road into a much more complex system. Boats, trains, and large vehicles work together in tandem to ensure uninterrupted economic prosperity. That is, if all parties consent to cross-continental trade. The Silk Road was a legendary strategic fulcrum for China. 15 centuries of development could not have happened as fast as it did without the help of the world's greatest overland network. It gave the greatest dynasties the ability to facilitate long-lasting policies that, unlike its Western neighbors, arguably helped China rise up from the ashes after every systematic failure. China's problem, as it's always been, is its tendency to neglect external changes and decentralize the governing body. This can be observed from the timeline of China's last empire, the Great Qing, 1636-1912. The Great Qing Empire was founded by the Manchus, a farming people once known as the Jurchens. By the mid-1600s, the last empire resurrected some of the policies that tied the land together in the past. Following in the footsteps of Emperor Wu, they adopted a Neo-Confucian philosophy and consolidated power playing a vast geopolitical chess game to acquire influence over Mongolia and Tibet. Much of this would not have been possible without the long-established pathways of the eastern part of the Silk Road. For the next 200 years, China would use its part of an ancient trade route to slowly expand into a global superpower once more. However, as has been a repeat issue, they neglected to look beyond their borders. Economic disagreements and the opium crisis led to the first opium war, revealing to the world the country's inability to match more modern naval power. This was only the beginning of a new cycle. Like many dynasties before the Great Qing, outside interference and a destabilized court led to immense hardship. A final uprising on October 10, 1911, led to the bloody Xinhai Revolution. By February 12, 1912, abdication was an inevitability, leading to the end of China's final empire. The following century led to a genocidal communist revolution where the ancient paths connecting the Silk Road were used for extreme reform and industrialization projects. Today, China's military is made up of 2.8 million soldiers, all ready to be deployed at a moment's notice. Its economy accounts for over 17% of the global GDP, second only to the US, and is valued at around $18 trillion. 
Much of this can be attributed to China's Belt and Road Initiative, or BRI, the product of the road the Han Dynasty started to support about 2,000 years ago. As for China's future, it once again remains uncertain. Like every government before the Republic, conflicts with the West and a bloated bureaucracy indicate that hard times are ahead. At least for now, China remains a main player on the world stage, a feat that would not have been possible if not for the foresight of the merchants of the ancient past. The Silk Road has been responsible for an unprecedented level of prosperity, but it's also contributed to some of the worst tragedies. It fueled and to some was solely responsible for the Black Plague, a devastating wave that killed up to 30 to 50 percent of the entire world population. Between 75 to 200 million innocent people once it reached the heart of London in 1348. It fueled the rampage of the Mongol Empire, which, although it contributed greatly to the development of countless societies, also killed 37.5 to 60 million during the Great Conquest. The spread of China's black powder invention, although it ended feudalism and helped agriculture, ignited military expeditions that accelerated military-related deaths on a mass scale. In the Middle East, helping to contribute to rapid growth, the Silk Road also made it easier for states that would have otherwise had to rely on one another. An argument could be made that, aside from how much wealth and prosperity was brought to the region, wealth strengthened the divide by allowing inorganic settlements to flourish. To this day, many geopolitical experts say that peace between these nations is close to unattainable. The disappearance of the Silk Road also came with major issues. Nations like Iraq, a territory with very little to support itself independently, have resorted to attacking its neighbors. Although the civilian death toll of such conflicts can largely be attributed to the U.S., its existence is partially the product of trade that no longer exists in the same capacity, leading many to theorize that silk routes caused unintentional consequences all over the world. That said, the last theory is a bit of a stretch, but it would explain why members of otherwise uninhabitable terrain have resorted to looking outward to forcefully sustain themselves. There are other trade routes that sometimes rival the legendary Silk Road, such as the Spice Routes, maritime paths linking the east to the west. Many attribute its height in the 15th, 16th, and 17th centuries to the Age of Exploration, where naval improvements changed the world forever. There's the Incense Route, which, at its zenith, was reported to transport 3,000 tons of substance annually. The Tin Route, although not as well documented, has been uncovered as a Bronze and Iron Age monolith, providing precious metals to countries like Britain, France, and Greece. Historians now believe that such routes were the catalyst for some of the greatest inventions of the time. Unlike the Silk Road, most of the evidence for this pathway has been lost. As for other trade routes that challenge the Silk Road, the more modern developments will undoubtedly be the stuff of legend in the distant future. The Panama Canal is among these, a creation once thought to be impossible when attempted by engineers of the 16th century. 25,000 men died building it, and it is now considered to be one of the finest transportation catalysts, helping transport goods from about 14,000 ships every year. The Strait of Malacca, another vital trade vein between the Indonesian island of Sumatra to the southwest and the Malay Peninsula to the northeast, supplies oil to China and Indonesia. According to the EIA, the Strait of Malacca is the primary choke point in Asia. And in recent years, between 85% and 90% of annual total petroleum flows through this checkpoint were crude oil. Finally, we have the Suez Canal, a trade route connecting the Mediterranean Sea to the Indian Ocean via the Red Sea. It hosts around 19,000 freighters annually and is a key supplier of energy for the planet. Theoretically, if shut down, it would mean the collapse of every major economy in the world, bringing a lot of production to a screeching halt. Since revived interest in the 19th century, countries have a renewed interest in the Silk Road that hasn't been observed since the time of Tamerlane. Eastern powers like China, Russia, and India have started major initiatives to breathe new life into the once diseased network. In the Middle East, traders still use pieces of it to supply villages with everything from handmade goods, spices, and cattle, to life-saving medicines and villages close to the beaten path. Additionally, 
Tours have opened for the ambitious backpackers seeking to walk in the same steps as so many others like Zhang Qian and Marco Polo. Nothing comes close to the legacy of the Silk Routes, cultural lifelines that brought us the environment we currently take for granted. As global conflict escalates, it's difficult to determine if we will ever see the likes of it again. The powers that appear to have their own visions for how to use their own respective extensions that they inherited from times past. Maybe one day, if humanity can manage to diplomatically resolve the issues that keep us divided, we can once again build with one another, using one of humanity's greatest achievements, the Silk Road. Now watch why building the Panama Canal was so deadly, or China's man-made military islands are a disaster.